Good morning, good morning. Welcome to Portland Bible Church, currently meeting here at our home in Vancouver, Washington. I'm Pastor Gary Glennie, and thank you so much for coming to join with us live in person today. Uh, those that are here and also those who are live streaming on Judy Glennie's Facebook page. You can also get the messages after the service on the website at portlandbiblechurch.com. Top of the home page, it has services. There's a drop-down menu there. You can go to a link to YouTube and get the services. Oh, we have almost two years, not quite two years of services on the Facebook and not quite that much on YouTube. Also, we have the audio of all of our services at the website as well. And we have about 80 or so person, uh, studies, uh, written studies that you can download or study or read at your leisure there in the doctrine section. And so all of this material is available to you free. You just tune right in and we are glad to have you. Our classes are Sunday morning right now at 10 o'clock and we take a little break. And then we have a second service at 1115 and after the second service, we have uh, about a half hour of singing the great hymns of the church. So if you join with us, uh, we have just a great time of fellowship, get to do some Christmas music today. And so hopefully you could uh, join with us, those that are here. And uh, if you come, even get here for the second service and you could join us for that. And then on Wednesday, my wife Judy has a ladies Bible study right here at our house. And she is going through the seven churches in Asia Minor in Revelation chapter two and three. And then on Thursday, we have our Bible study and also our prayer meeting after that. And the Bible study on Thursday deals with leadership. We're just about to finish up the kings, the southern kings, uh, the eight good kings of the southern kingdom called Judah. And then we're going to look at a study of the principles, about 30 principles of good leadership and characteristics of good leaders. And of course, those would apply to all of us because sooner or later, uh, we're all in a position of authority and responsibility. And therefore, these principles of leadership apply to all of us, especially those who are in uh, CEOs or military, anywhere where there's a chain of command and you have a position <laughs> of authority. The uh, various uh, notes that I have, I had one here we talked about in a previous class, if you weren't with us, and that is the information on patriotism, and uh, the, it's called patriotacademy.com, patriotacademy.com. Uh, Rick Green and many others are presenting the history of our freedom in this country and the truth that doesn't seem to be making it into the media and sadly, in many cases, not making it into the school system as well. And if you want the latest information on the virus, you can get that at uh, the uh, website covid.daystar.com. They give you all the information. You can make your decision there uh, with how you will approach this particular virus situation. So covid.daystar.com. So we try to give out the information. You can make your decisions. <laughs> the patriotacademy.com. Uh, they do have some training available. Judy and I are going through some of the training right now. It's just excellent, just a, a wealth of material, many things that, that those of us have gone through the educational system in the past have never heard. So it's very, very fascinating, uh, as well as instructive for us. It's our custom to take a few moments at the beginning of each, our, each of our Bible studies for silent prayer. This gives us the opportunity to acknowledge to the Father any sins that we're aware of. In 1 John 1, 9, he clearly teaches that if we, believers, confess our sins, name them, cite them, agree with God that they're sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. That is to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, anything that we're not aware of uh, or we've just forgotten. So we make sure that we clear the deck, so to speak, so that we can understand the mind of Christ, which is the word of God. So with that in mind and in preparation for our study this morning, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gracious provision for us, the fact that you have a plan for us from eternity past, in through this life, and even beyond this into our life with you and resurrection in the future. We thank you that you've given us your word from Genesis to Revelation, inclusive, exclusive of any other writing, so that we can understand who and what you are, 
your plan for us, and of course, all of the things that are part of our blessings and rewards that accrue to us because of our obedience. Help us to be obedient, Father, to the things that you teach us. And this morning, we pray that the things we study would become part of our permanent store of resident doctrine in our soul so that we can make application as needed to every situation we face in this life. Now, as we study, we pray that you would encourage, challenge, and motivate us by the things that we study, for we pray it all in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. Then the dead in Christ shall rise first. <laughs> And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approach. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word this morning once again to the book of Hebrews chapter 9 and really in verse 4, but I wanted to backtrack just a little bit and pick up a few things. It's always good to review a little bit. Uh, sometimes I get accused of reviewing too much, but just imagine how many times I've gone over this passage, literally hundreds of times, so it won't hurt you to go over it once or twice uh, in terms of a review, because that's how we learn. They tell us you have to think about something or study something or to commit to memory some 20 or 25 times uh, in order to get it to stick in our memory. So a couple of times of review never hurts because many times uh, things that I've learned in the past, I think I know so well, even some of the scriptures that I often quote, and as I'm quoting them, <laughs> suddenly I draw a blank. Some people might think that's old age or Alzheimer, but it's just the fact that, uh, you know, it, it, things drop out of our memory and therefore we need to rehearse them, uh, especially things that are honorable, such as the word of God. Sadly, many people rehearse things that are detriments to them, uh, things that are oppressive to them and they keep rehearsing them, but we should be rehearsing and uh, drawing on the things of the word of God and storing them and dwelling the word of God richly in our hearts. Okay, so if we're in the, uh, you have your outline there, you might, uh, if you need the outline, those are available at the outline and uh, um, chart section on the website, you can check that out. And this is the outline, of course, of Hebrews. And we're in basically the second major section, the superiority of the new covenant, which really goes from chapter 8 to chapter 10. And then we have the conclusion uh, and a lot of application from 11 through chapter 13. But 8 through chapter 10 deals with the superiority of the new covenant. The first thing we looked at, of course, was its superiority and the idea that it was a better covenant, certainly the best covenant, if you will, better than the Mosaic covenant or any that went before but primarily better than the Mosaic Covenant. And then the second section dealt with the prophecy of the New Covenant. We noted that, and also the fact that the New Covenant would, got, would be different in that the laws, uh, unlike the Mosaic Covenant, written on stone and parchment, would be written on the hearts of those who believe. And then the third section that we just began in chapter 9 is the fact that the first covenant had a worship system and regulations. It also had the sanctuary, which was the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, uh, later replaced, of course, by the temple, uh, the Solomonic temple and other temples in the future, as well as the uh, temple of Zerubbabel, which was a refurbishing of the Solomonic temple, and then the temple of Herod, where he updated and added some features as well. But ultimately, it was a literal earthly sanctuary or tabernacle, if you will, where God met with people. And of course, uh, this is where he interfaced through the high priests at that time. The book of Hebrews, of course, emphasizes the fact that the priesthood uh, at that time uh, was made up of multiple priests who later would die. Some of them did a good job. Some did a terrible job. But all of that system would be replaced by uh, this new covenant and a new high priest, uh, one that would be eternal. And that, of course, refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's where the writer of Hebrews is heading with all of this. And so we noted in chapter 9, verse 1, uh, and so far down, 
down through verse 4, uh, we see this divine worship. We see the holy place and the holy of holies in verse 3, and then the Ark of the Covenant in 4 and 5. And so we see these are the parts or the elements within. Some of them are kind of like furniture, although I don't think of all of them as being furniture, but that's what we would probably term them, the furnishings, if you will, within the tabernacle itself, uh, made up of two compartments as well as an outer courtyard. And so last time we started looking at some of the features of the tabernacle, the outer court, uh, the holy place, and we didn't quite get to the holy of holies, we got to the veil. So I wanted to pick that up where we left off last time, and so we have uh, in this uh, verse, uh, verse 3, which is where we kind of were uh, looking at it, that uh, talks about in verse 2, we have the outer court, and then it says it talks about the lampstand uh, and of the table and the sacred bread, uh, which is called the holy place. Now, actually, there are several things in the outer court that are not mentioned here, and the reason that they're not mentioned uh, is because uh, uh, of brevity. And the writer of Hebrews even says down there that uh, he's not going to go into detail in verse 5. He says, uh, these things we cannot now speak in detail because it's not his emphasis uh, in this book, of this epistle to the Hebrews, to uh, read teach everything that's in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, but rather to simply talk about the fact that the new covenant replaces all of these things. However, this was written to a Jewish audience, and they would immediately understand what he was talking about if they were familiar with the um, five books of Moses, the Pentateuch. And uh, But for those of us who are Gentile believers, and many Christians today have very little knowledge of the Old Testament, I dare say in the average church, if you talk to people about the altar of burnt offering or the altar of incense, they wouldn't really know what you're talking about. I mean, I hope they would, but I have talked to many people today, and they go, well, what's that? And I'd say, well, that's part of the tabernacle, and they many times aren't even familiar with the tabernacle. So Gentile Christians often are weak in their understanding of the Old Testament. So because of that, I thought I would take some time, last class and this class, to kind of review the things that are part of the tabernacle. In the outer court, where we see things that are not in this text in Hebrews, and the first thing that we come into or see in that area when we come through the gate, if you will, of the outer court uh, yard uh, is the altar of burnt offering. A rather large thing, as we noted uh, in the previous class, it's about seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet, and it's five foot high. This is where all the offerings, the burnt offerings uh, were given, the peace offering, sin offering, and all of these things, the guilt and trespass offering, or, or trespass offering, all these were offered there. Some of them burnt completely, others, of course, roasted, and it just depended on the particular sacrifice. And all of this is spelled out in Leviticus chapters 1 through 6 and elsewhere in Exodus and then reviewed again in places in Deuteronomy. So we see it all over. It's not just one section that covers everything, but it's all through the book of Exodus, Numbers, uh, Le Leviticus, and the <clears throat> numbers and Deuteronomy. And so this first one then This is a heavy dude, but I'll tell you what, I can only imagine what this thing weighed in actuality. Uh, uh, the scale here is like I'm not sure, but you got uh, about uh, 10 inches. And that was seven and a half feet. So it's much larger. You can see, by the way, all of these always maintain the poles. I didn't put them in last week, but uh, all of these, they leave the poles in because the whole concept was that they take a sanctuary, the tabernacle, and all of the features and so-called furniture, and they would carry this to the next location. And I'm thinking this, this baby is really heavy. You can imagine, you can perhaps see it from the front or the top. And you can see there's a grate in there, and so they would actually uh, roast the animal, or of course they would, the Holocaust offering, which was the burnt offering, uh, they would burn it completely. As we understand, that portrayed the work of Jesus Christ totally dying on the cross. Of course, he was not incinerated as the burnt offering. He did not have his throat slit. So it's a representative teaching of, from the Old Testament, and Christ fulfilled that uh, by his death on the cross. So this is the altar of the burnt <laughs> offering. You'll notice there's horns on the corner, and this is where the blood, some of the blood was spilled, uh, and also on the altar of incense. They would mark all of the four posts or uh, these sharp 
pointed ends that we see, they would actually put blood on all of these on the altar of incense, and eventually uh, they would put it on the mercy seat. Once a year, the high priest would go in and do that. So this is the first feature that you see coming into the courtyard. Pardon me for stepping out of frame. That thing is heavy, even as it is. I can only imagine how many people it took to carry that. And they must have had quite a cadre of people because you could only carry it a short distance and then you were out of there and the next group would come in. However, uh, when we understand that there were at least uh, uh, at the time of Solomon and earlier, there were some 24,000 priests. Uh, there were many Levites that were part of the priestly tribe, and then there are those of the line of Aaron specifically who had the duty within the actual sanctuary, the holy and the holy of holies, which was only entered uh, by the high priest in the line of Aaron. But we have all these priests. You imagine 24,000 priests. So they had enough to have several groups of people that would take care of the altar of burnt offering and all the others as well. And when we get to the Ark of the Covenant, same thing. There had to be quite a few people to carry because that thing in itself, uh, just the lid on top of that, the mercy seat and the uh, uh, cherubim or cherubim, as you would call them, they were all one piece of solid gold. And I was trying to figure out the weight of that thing and what it would be. And I came up with something between six or eight hundred pounds and maybe a little over a thousand pounds. And so if you had like six or eight people on that, it still was going to be 80 to 100 pounds a person carrying that thing. And of course, they couldn't touch it. They could only pick up the pole, pick it up by the pole. So uh, we see, and this had to be moved and perhaps a great distance. So they would have to have many courses of people who would shift and pick up these various things. And it wasn't just the altar of burnt offering, wasn't just the Ark of the Covenant, but we have the other features as well. Uh, and so the second one that we see in the outer court is the laver. And no one really knows uh, how the laver looked. And I'm sure that Moses got instructions as to how to build this. Uh, and we know how Solomon built it because that's explained to us. But here we see it's just kind of a little bowl or a dish. And it has a stand here, as you can see, in this, um, this model of the model of what's in heaven. And so we have the stand and the bowl. Some believe that there were actually two of these. So there'll be a lower level and an upper level. No one knows for sure. Uh, the guess is that it's probably three or four feet across. And so uh, this is what the labor might have looked like. And then the double would be the upper one for washing the hands and the lower one for washing the feet. And so they just, no one really knows for sure. And I'm sure there's some tradition on this, but even in the mag in the books that describe it, uh, they say we don't have the exact information. So this was before you entered into the holy place. So the first thing would be the altar of burnt offering. Then before you would alt move into the holy place, uh, then you would have the laver and wash hands and feet in order to cleanse yourself before you went into the holy place. So we have that one. And then, of course, once we go into the holy place, there are actually two veils. Uh, there's a veil at the front of the tent. And then there is a second section which uh, has a veil and is called the holy most holy place or the holy of holies. And so inside of this first place, when you would go in, you could actually see what you were doing because there was light. And on the left side, we have the candelabra called the menorah. And so the menorah, as you remember, looks something like this. Again, no one is sure uh, exactly how tall this was, perhaps five or six feet and maybe three and a half feet wide. So it's fairly large. And of course, you have these almond-shaped uh, uh, features at the top where they would put the olive oil, and it had to be tended daily. And so they had to make sure there was oil, and the oil took eight days to consecrate. So it was quite a production to keep this thing lit, sometimes called the eternal light. We believe it represents the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the light of the world. But in this case, it was simply the way of seeing. And you can only imagine when you would go in, that is the priest who had the custody of taking care of this menorah, uh, when they went in there, this light, uh, the dancing of the flames would reflect off all of the gold, the gold in the altar of incense, on the gold of the uh, candelabra itself, and on the gold that was in the table of the showbread. So you see, 
I got to get there. I'll put it a little closer there. And these models are just really magnificent. They've been uh, made as much to scale uh, as they possibly could be. And so you see the six uh, legs or uh, uh, parts of this and then the one in the center from which you light all the others. Uh, we know that there's one similar to this in Hanukkah. We just studied that recently. And they added a, an extra two um, candles or uh, oil parts to it. And therefore, there are four on each side. And the eight represented, of course, the days of Hanukkah when the menorah that they had at that time lasted for eight days with only enough consecrated oil for one day. So they decided to actually make a special menorah for Hanukkah. And so uh, we understand that, but a lot of people say, well, why does one have uh, seven and the other have nine? Well, it's because they added those two because of the days of Hanukkah. So you have the one that was in the tabernacle, which is the one featured in Israel, many, many places. Uh, they even have a very large one over there, kind of a monument of the regular uh, uh, menorah that was in the tabernacle. So we have that. And uh, so that's the first thing that we see when we go in. As you would enter, the priest would enter, and a priest or perhaps several priests. We're not really told how many. Some think that uh, there was a priest in charge of each of these. Some think it was one priest. And again, uh, there's no biblical record of uh, how many priests actually did this, plus the fact that this changed weekly. So every week there would be new priests or priests that would go in and take care of the candelabra. And the other two features, one was, of course, the table of showbread, so-called. The table of showbread, Russell, table of showbread, uh, where we have, uh, and again, give me this, and you can see that in this case, just like all the others, they always left the, the poles in there so that they, <laughs> they could move this at a moment's notice. If God said you're moving out, uh, they, have, they take down the tent, wrap everything up, and that must have been an incredible production. I can only think about some of the productions that we have today with the musical groups that come into town, all of the lighting, the stage setting, uh, all of the speakers and the sound systems, uh, and just the amazing production, and that, that many times they have several uh, tractor trailers that would actually have all of the material that they would uh, set up. Well, you can only imagine they didn't have tractor trailers in the day of Moses. And so this all had to be carried by hand or on carts. And so it was just a major, major production. But again, keep in mind, 24,000 priests uh, that were involved with this. So you had enough manpower uh, of the several millions that had come out of Egypt to do this. Now, this particular, uh, what we call a table of the bread of presence, presence, three feet long, basically, and then about a foot and a half wide, measured in cubits, but I'm giving approximate. So about three feet long. So you can see the poles are probably about another four to six feet, maybe eight feet, uh, depending. Uh, they give us no specifications on the length of the poles. Uh, the poles themselves were wood, and uh, just like all of the furnishings were something called acacia wood. And in the Bible, acacia wood is a, is a heavy oak. In fact, it's very similar, if not the same, as the gopher wood that the Ark of uh, Moses, I'm uh, sorry, <laughs> the Ark of Noah, uh, when he built that great boat that you'll remember, that was made of something called gopher wood. And it may be, in fact, the same as acacia or a, a similar wood, very, very hard, like we would consider oak today. And so uh, the uh, w w wood that was used to build these, and then they were completely overlaid with hammered gold. So it was heavy because of the gold. Uh, and then the poles, the same thing. They were wood, probably that same um, acacia wood. And then they were covered and uh, with this gold all over. So you actually had a tremendous amount of gold. And then you have the four legs. On top of it, it had the uh, uh, 12 pieces of bread. And these were made uh, every week. And so they had to be changed out weekly uh, on the Sabbath. And so there's uh, two stacks of six. The one thing that's not m here would be there was some type of a dish or a uh, uh, cup or uh, what do we say? Pitcher, a pitcher that had the uh, uh, 
the uh, drink offering, which was wine, and that, of course, was poured as part of every offering that was made. A lot of people don't realize that, and we see the wine, of course, uh, as the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit was involved in every sacrifice. So uh, there was this picture of uh, of wine that was right on this table with the showbread. I, I threatened to see if I can find one in a little uh, model sometime and put one on here. This is the thing that is missing, but it was part of this. And so we have the table then of the showbread, and it was a memorial to the fact that Israel was fed by the manna from heaven that God provided. And so it was to remind the 12 tribes that God had provided this for them. And then, of course, at the end of the week, when the priest would replace this, that would be something they could eat. You say, well, it's week old. Well, uh, nothing wrong with week old bread. God can provide just as he did with the uh, people in the wilderness. In fact, they weren't even to gather up uh, extra manna on the Sabbath day. They It would actually keep till the next day, and that was just the manna from heaven. So God could provide, and this then bread became part of the payment, if you will, for the Levitical priests that were part of this uh, actual worship team, if you could call it that. And again, how many were involved? There are many courses, and we'll talk about that, but when you talk about 24,000 uh, men involved in ministry, that's quite a cadre of people, and just the ones of the tribe of Aaron that would be involved would be several thousands, and they rotated through this operation in the tabernacle. And then, of course, uh, the next thing was the altar of incense. The altar of incense was just before the curtain or the veil. And the altar of incense, like the others, of course, uh, the poles were always left in there so that they could easily be picked up. Usually you just see the altar, but the poles were supposed to be in there. Again, we don't have the length of the poles, but you can see that it would have to be uh, enough for several people to be involved. It was about three feet high and about a foot and a half uh, square. And so if you think that that would be a cubit, basically, one cubit square, which was about 18 inches, the standard cubit. And so again, you see the horns on this particular altar of incense. And then there would be the uh, area here where they would actually put the uh, coals, the burning coals, and then they would put the incense on top of that. And this was done twice a day. It was done in the morning and it was done in the evening. The thing that is interesting about all of these things is how it was done habitually, day in, day out, morning and night in some cases, or weekly in the case of the showbread, daily, of course, in terms of the uh, uh, the uh, menorah. And so we have this, and the priests had to uh, burn the incense on the altar, as we said, uh, twice a day. And then, of course, they would, uh, on one special day, the Day of Atonement, the highest holy day in Israel, they had a special fry pan of some sort, and they would take, take the uh, burning coals and that fry pan, and they would then, or that be the high priest only, would enter into the Holy of Holies. So this was right in front of the curtain. In fact, that's why the book of Hebrews seems to intimate uh, that it was in that Holy of Holies. It was just before the curtain. And of course, the grammar allows for the fact that it was uh, a feature that was connected with the second veil. And we'll look at that verse again as we go through it. I just wanted to show you the props here so you can see this. And again, you can see this altar uh, three feet high and uh, one and a half feet, and then the poles probably eight to ten feet across. Uh, we don't know, but the priest would then take that fry pan uh, with the burning coals because when he went into the Holy of Holies, there was no light at all, totally dark. And so and, uh, when he went through the curtain, he had to just be very careful, and the, the coals would illuminate as best that they could. And then, of course, uh, on that day, he would take that fry pan, sit it on the floor, and before he before he approached the altar, uh, 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 the uh, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the altar, uh, which was the only feature inside the Holy of Holies, then he would sprinkle the uh, material as far as the incense on it, and that would make smoke that would basically fill that entire area, uh, actually just as it would in the uh, holy place, but now in the Holy of Holies, it would fill that with smoke, and he really couldn't see anything. So he had to time it just right, as I understand, uh, to go over and put the blood on the mercy seat, and then he would exit with his fry pan, and of course it would be totally dark, and the Lord uh, would recognize that, and of course the, we'll get to the uh, Ark of the Covenant in just a moment. So we have this, 
as far as the, uh, this, and the, the only one we don't have is the sensor that he would actually have. And so if you can see that, there it is. Okay. And then finally, we get to the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was just a box. And the box was a little over three feet, about three feet nine. Uh, if you think of a sheet of plywood, four by eight, uh, plywood four feet wide. So it was just short of four feet wide. Or long, I guess I should say. And then about uh, two and a, two, a little over two feet uh, and then 27 inches in height. Uh, so we see this. Uh, uh, let's see, 24, five, yeah, 27. So we have 27 high and 27 wide. And you'll notice on top that we have the cherubim. These are the highest order of angels. They're mentioned, of course, in Ezekiel and elsewhere. We have many other angels that are mentioned in Scripture. There are the seraphims, only mentioned twice in the whole Bible in the Old Testament. Uh, and their name connotes burning. And so we don't know what that means, but that's the second category. And apparently they're very high. But the cherubim, the highest order, perhaps, in fact, uh, that uh, Hillel, or as we know him, Satan, was one of the cherubim, the highest order. Then there are many other in the chain of command of angels. We've studied those in the past. But the cherubim were the highest, and they were set on top of the mercy seat, and they were solid gold, and they were merged with the mercy seat itself. Also, the poles that were in there, the same, made of acacia wood covered with gold. And so when we took off the lid, that is the mercy seat, you can see that it's all one piece of solid gold. Again, this was the dominant amount of gold that would make weight for this particular thing. And it sat right on the top. The high priest would sprinkle the blood right here on the mercy seat when he went in. And of course, the only way he could find it was the fact of those burning coals. And then he would sprinkle the mercy on the mercy seat and, uh, and then put the uh, incense. And that would fill that room. And then he would exit. He only did that once a year. And so this was in there. And when they carried this, you remember that uh, uh, this thing was carried, had to be carried very carefully. In fact, one time uh, they had people who it seemed like it was going to topple over and someone pushed it to keep it from falling and they died, uh, which I guess is where they got the idea in the, um, in the movie, what was it, the... Uh, uh, Raiders. Raiders of the Lost Ark, that it was, you know, a pain of death because obviously this was so holy, you didn't touch it. You could only touch the poles here and they were part of it. Now these poles, uh, interesting feature, they're not sure how the poles were attached. Based on the scripture, it's very difficult. This has the poles attached at the legs and uh, seems like that's what the scripture says, but the leg, of course, could be all the way up the side, so it could be attached anywhere along that. It also says in the scriptures that they were on the sides, and of course, if we think of these as the ends, and these the sides, then these are on the wrong side. And so different authors and different commentators uh, put these in different places. Some put them up here, halfway down, some at the bottom. And of course, this would be fairly stable, but if they were on the bottom uh, going this way, you could see this thing would be very unstable. So uh, uh, in fact, in the book that I have, I'll show you in just a moment, they show it both ways. And they have it kind of, they, they uh, cheated and put it up here kind of in the middle because it would make sense. It would be easier to carry and it wouldn't topple as easy uh, if they had it up a little higher. No one knows for sure because the scripture and the way it's written, obviously Moses knew and that was it, but we don't have the ark. We don't have a, uh, a copy or picture of the ark. And so we just don't know exactly. But we do know the lid, very, very heavy, this whole thing weighing, as we noted, uh, probably uh, near, uh, I've tried to calculate as best I could, somewhere between 700 and uh, 1100 pounds, depending on the thickness of the gold. So it had to be fairly thick because gold, of course, uh, is soft and therefore it was solid gold and it was only like a, a quarter of an inch thick. That probably wouldn't be enough. So if we get up to three eighths or a half inch, that's a whole lot more gold weighing a lot more. Again, we have no record of this. So all we know is the marvel and the wonder of this thing. And this is where God would meet with men uh, and the high priest in the time that Moses was given all of these uh, pieces. Now, once we take the lid off, 
which is the mercy seat, all one piece with the cherubim. Then we have what's inside. And the best we can tell, although it doesn't spell it out in the Old Testament, in the book of Hebrews, it actually tells us specifically. And so we assume that that's what happened. Uh, we had three features that were part of the inside of the box. By the way, the box was made of acacia wood, covered over with the gold. And inside were, of course, at one time early on, from, a, from the writing of Hebrews and the fact that these are the tables of stone. Now, they give us two little things that look like the tables of stone. And I've looked closely, and there's no Hebrew on there, I'm sorry, but it would be, this is a, this is a model. And so these were, of course, uh, the stones that would have been cut out of the mountain. And so in the beginning, we'll talk about that a little bit later, the fact that the tables of stone first were made by God, and he, with the finger of God, uh, as it says in scripture, wrote the Ten Commandments or the Devarim. Uh, however, when Moses went down the mountain, you'll remember, he threw these at the people because of their disobedience and they all broke into pieces. And of course, the people had a great judgment when he came down at that time. Well, this wasn't something God had designed. So the next time, uh, there's about five different times that Moses went up the mountain. Unlike the movie, shows him go up twice. Uh, in fact, it doesn't even show the second time. It just says that uh, God restored the Ten Commandments. But he went up five times. It wasn't until the fourth time that he actually got the tables of stone. When he came down, he threw them at the people, and they were broken and destroyed. So the next time, the Lord said, when you come up, make your own stone. Stones. Cut your own stones and bring them up. And he wrote with his finger on the stones, but he made Moses cut them out because of his disobedience. At any rate, these ended up in the ark, uh, in the box, and they were there for some time. We don't know how long or when they were removed, but apparently they were taken out and lost at some time. We don't have those. Then there was a pot of some sort, and that was the pot of manna. Apparently, early on at least, God allowed them to keep some in memorial. Apparently, it didn't rot or anything. It maintained its uh, purity all through the time that it was in the Ark of the Covenant. And so it was the pot of manna that was there. And then we have one other feature. And the other feature, we'll talk about these in just a moment. The other feature was the uh, rod of Aaron. It's just a little stick but it had blooms on it. So in other words, it was a dead stick, uh, couldn't bloom. And so uh, they decided to uh, uh, put this, they put the names of the tribes here on this. And then I think it had in the name of Aaron, some things were written on the stick and they put it down for the night. And when they got up in the morning, it had bloomed, a dead stick. And so it was the Aaron's rod, this was his rod, uh, you know, his walking rod, you can see, uh, so a larger at the top, kind of a staff, just like Moses had, and this thing had budded, and so that was kept in there. Those three things, and they each had their own significance that we'll look at in just a moment. So uh, we're going to come back, but I wanted to show each of these, and again, the poles were left in. I think these are maybe a little short and may have been a little more, a little more stout, uh, because uh, remember that the Holy of Holies was 15 by 15 by 15. It was a perfect cube. And so the longest they could have been would have been short of 15 feet. Uh, but uh, I'm guessing that uh, because the ark was three feet, so that would figure uh, four, four, eight, nine, ten, eleven, may have been eight to ten feet or more. Uh, and of course, if they went across, then they would go on the front and the back side. If they went this way, they would actually uh, protrude towards the, the veil that was in front. In fact, it even tells us that in Solomon's day, when he had the temple, that these uh, poles actually almost stuck out of the veil between the Holy of Holies and the Holy. In other words, they were right up there. So in that sense, it looked like they were uh, set up in this particular orientation. But uh, in terms of the actual tabernacle, we're not sure how that worked. So those are the pieces of the, if we call them furnishings, within the tabernacle itself. And so uh, <clears throat> so what was involved here, of course, were the five offerings that we saw. 
and we had the burnt offering, which was totally consumed. We see that as portraying the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. The grain offering, which was also part of uh, almost every sacrifice, and they had them done in different ways on different days, but all of these were done continually. Burnt offering every day, 365 days a year. Uh, it's, just, it's just amazing to me. Thousands and thousands of animals. I don't think they could even do this today because uh, we'd have the Humane Society down and say, you can't can't kill all those animals. That's just that's just wrong. Well, God told them to do it, and it was something that was teaching that a blood sacrifice was necessary for the forgiveness of sin. Christ, of course, fulfilled that completely. Then the peace offering. I like the peace offering because that I always think about that, and I don't mean to demean it. I always think of that as kind of the family friendly. Uh, uh, kind of a, a potluck dinner. That's a terrible way to describe it. But they actually got to eat and share in the peace offering, whereas the uh, burnt offering was totally burned up. But the peace offering, the people got to share in it, and it was kind of a fellowship, friendly type thing. And so we have that one for fellowship. We have the perfect humanity of Christ represented by the, by the grain or meal offering. And then the work of Christ is death on the cross by the burnt offering. There were two other offerings, and those were the sin offering. Uh, that was, of course, for unknown sin, generic sin, because obviously uh, the nation had been sinful. The high priest would be a, have an old sin nature. And so uh, every day they had a sin offering just in case, <laughs> and I'm sure they needed to have it. And then if you committed a sin that you were aware of, a known sin, there was what's called a trespass or a guilt offering, which meant you were guilty. You said, man, I did it. Uh, and so that's why in 1 John 1, 9, we can confess our sins, and then all unrighteousness picks up the ones we forgot about or didn't know about. Those would be the unknown sins uh, because we can't remember them, and uh, maybe we just, uh, uh, it's been a long time. And so we have that, and that, of course, referred to the immediate exercise of the offering of the sin offering, and the priest got to have uh, much of the leftovers from those various offerings. And then the drink offering was included with every sacrifice, and that spoke of the Holy Spirit, and it was included in all the others. Now, the courtyard itself was about 150 feet by 75 feet across. The tabernacle itself was 15 feet by 30 feet. And so uh, we have a uh, the, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, fifth, uh, let's see, yeah, 15, 15 at perfect square, and then we have another uh, 20 feet, I think, in front of that. Oh, no, 30 feet. I'm looking at the cubit, sorry. Uh, so the holy place was 30 feet across by 15 feet wide. And that's inside, centered towards the back end of the courtyard. Of course, the brazen altar and the laver in front of it as you would enter from the east. And so then we have the Holy of Holies right after the veil of 15 by 15 by 15 high. Matter of fact, the veil itself was 15 feet high and 15 feet wide. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, later. And so that kind of gets us through what we see in the passages, uh, uh, the things that are here and the things that are not here as well. Um, what's our time? What? Okay. So what I have here is something I developed, and uh, this is available at the website, and uh, that is uh, the Ark of the Covenant. And I show here several features of the Ark of the Covenant. I'll try to hold this up. Uh, you can go to the website and take a look at this. It looks something like this. You see on the left side, we have the Ark of the Covenant. Then we have the three features that were part of it. The uh, Ten Commandments, the two tables of stone. We have Aaron's rod that budded and also the pot of manna. And so you can see these. And the first one, of course, at the top, we talk about the fact that basically, let's see if we can get that level here. There we go. Yeah, there it is. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant speaks about God's nature, and this one uh, deals with the fact that man's position is unworthy, but the blood on the mercy seat gives us access to God. And so we have God's presence, which is represented by the Ark of the Covenant, 
And of course, so inside of that, it speaks about the features that we see here that spoke to the fact that man was sinful, couldn't keep the Ten Commandments, and he rejected the authority of God vested in Moses and Aaron. And of course, uh, uh, he was ungrateful, man, that is, Israel was ungrateful for the manna that they had received. So what the three features within the Ark of the Covenant represented was the sinfulness of man. And so we have God's nature in the ark itself and man's position as he would view the holiness of God and the presence of God. Secondly, we have the Ten Commandments, which represented uh, the idea of the word of God in its entirety, specifically here by these Ten Commandments. Now, there were 613 laws in the Mosaic Covenant, mm -hmm. so this is simply uh, a typical representation of the word of God and God's covenant relationship with Israel. And this, of course, deals with man's fellowship with God. How do we have fellowship with God? Through his word. And that was the idea of fellowship. The third, of course, the Aaron's rod that budded represented God's sovereignty and authority. Sovereignty is both the will of God and the authority of God. And he vested that in Moses and in Aaron, and many people rejecting both Moses and Aaron. Like, who do you think you guys are? You know, you're not God. Well, they were God's delegate and representation, representative, and God's delegated authority. And so we see that man's obedience was required by the this particular feature, and they had been disobedient time and time again. Finally, we have the pot of manna, which represents God's gracious plan. His plan, which is the fact that we have whatever we need. Israel had whatever they needed because God provided for them. And the manna was a gift of God from heaven. It literally fell out of heaven. They picked up what they needed for one day. And that would uh, suffice. And then, of course, for the Sabbath, they picked up enough to carry them through the Sabbath. And so this has to do with man's acceptance of the grace gift of God. All these features were then part of the Ark of the Covenant. And so we see this is what the writer of Hebrews is describing when he goes through this. Well, one other thing before we leave this, uh, I this is a picture right here of uh, the Ten Commandments in the old uh, Phoenician script, which is Paleo or Old Hebrew, and these were actually used in the movie, The Ten Commandments. You know, the old one with Charlton Heston and Yul Brynner. This is actually what they made, and there are nine of the ten written here. I've translated them, and so I've kept this. Uh, I don't know if these are still in the studio there uh, in movie land or not, but uh, these were the actual tables of stone or the uh, replica of them. It sounded like when Moses had them and they he clicked them together. They sounded like they were stones. And so this is the best representation of the Ten Commandments, I think, ever produced. And I was a little remiss that they left out the Fourth Commandment, maybe because uh, cinematically it would have been too crowded on the uh, on what they had made here. Uh, and I don't know, maybe uh, Cecil B. DeMille didn't know the fourth one was missing, but I do because I translated them. At any rate, that's what they look like there. And so, uh, well, you probably, I don't know if you can see it here. We'll start uh, up here. Uh, and the uh, we actually go from this one over here, the first one, and we see the first word up there is I am. And then we have in Paleo Hebrew, the Tetragrammaton, the Lord, I am the Lord, uh, your God. And so we have, that's what's up there, right up there, uh, translating it. And so we actually have uh, this information that was put on there. Now, I know it's about time to quit here, but I wanted to show you a couple of things. One is this book. It is a Ro Rose's Guide to the Tabernacle. Everything you want to know about the tabernacle, uh, this is Rose's Book of the Tabernacle. I don't have time to show you, but I've used this as a, an instructional guide to most of what I've taught. If you get this, it'll give you everything you need to know about the tabernacle. And just as a side note before we wrap it up here, believe it or not, this, this was the program that they gave when I went to this movie in 1955 with my parents, the Embassy Theater in Reading, Pennsylvania, and they gave out a program. Uh, and of course, here it has all the stars, Charlton Heston, Yul Brynner, everybody that was one of the stars, uh, kind of a bio of each of them, has this Ten Commandments in there. And so uh, we picked this up, and I'm glad that I kept it all these years. You can see uh, just some of the features 
here of, of what they actually showed. And then at the end, they have many of the things, the various tribal things that were part of the tribes, where they actually show their insignia that was on the pole, kind of the guide on for each of the tribes. They went through incredible detail in this particular movie. If you ever have a chance to see it again, note those things. Even the games that they played, all of these things were part of that movie. Uh, they probably couldn't even produce something like that today. And I just uh, thank the Lord that I got that years and years ago. So that's the information that we have. Well, I think we're just about finished and we'll have to come back next time. We won't have to look at the features inside uh, of the uh, tabernacle then. We'll simply go back through our verses and pick up the information that we need as far as our study. Uh, with that in mind, I think it's time for us to uh, take our break. Uh, so we'll have a uh, closing prayer and we'll take a little break and we'll come back in the second service. Father God, thank you again so much for this marvelous presentation that you've given us, not only here in the book of Hebrews in chapter 9, but what he refers to as we have examined oh so many passages in the books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy that pertain to the tabernacle and the service of worship and the priesthood and everything that went on in terms of the sacrificial system, all of those things which were training devices, training aids for the Hebrew people to understand the need for holiness, the need for a savior and deliverance from their sins. And Father, you portrayed it dramatically so that when we as believers in this dispensation look at the Lord Jesus Christ, we see how, according to the writers of the New Testament, he fulfilled everything that was part of this majestic system that God had portrayed. Not only that, Father, we recognize that there is such a tabernacle in heaven and that some of these will be repeated in memorial during the millennial kingdom. We look forward to that now as we understand uh, what these things represented and why you gave them to us, noting that it was the blood of the animal who represented what later would be the blood of our Savior Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. Father, we thank you for these things. And if there's one person here this morning without Christ, without hope, and without eternal life, we want that person, you, if it's you, to know that God had you in mind when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into human history to live a perfectly sinless life, therefore to qualify as the second Adam to bear the sins of the entire world, past, present, and future, every man, woman, and child, passed through all time and once and for all time on the cross so that now we have access to the high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ forever. Won't you believe in his finished work on the cross? John tells us in his first epistle, he wrote these things so that you may believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you might have eternal or everlasting life. God so loved the world that he gave his uniquely appointed son, his only born son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul said that he didn't want to know anything except Christ and him crucified, signifying the fact that Christ's death on the cross was totally sufficient for all sins, for all time, and for all people. Won't you make that decision? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you again for the opportunity of studying these magnificent features and all that they represent and the culmination and fulfillment of their meaning in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We thank you and we pray these things in his majestic and powerful name. Amen.